I'm Shane Morris with the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. How can Christians make our gospel witness more plausible in this increasingly atheistic and disenchanted culture? Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, John Stone Street talks with Paul Gould, professor of philosophy at Oklahoma Baptist University and author of the outstanding book, Cultural Apologetics, Renewing the Christian Voice, Conscience, and Imagination in a Disenchanted World. Here are John Stone Street and Paul Gould. Well, years ago, I came across a book by Oz Guinness, uh, which was kind of like written in the the style of the screw tape letters, and it was called something around the called the Grave Digger Thesis. And it was all a kind of about how the enemy had worked to undermine Christian witness in culture. And one of the things that he said has stuck with me. Actually, it was one of those kind of aha revolutionary moments, and it led me into an entire journey into a whole other side of understanding worldview, understanding apologetics, understanding Christian witness. And it was basically this idea of plausibility. It was this sense that whenever we do evangelism or whenever we do apologetics or anything like that, we're not doing it in a vacuum. We're doing it in a cultural context, and that cultural context it really dramatically impacts what people find believable. Even if you have the best argument for the truth, even if you have, you know, the best set of reasons or whatever. Well, I'm really thrilled to invite on the Breakpoint podcast today Paul Gould. Paul's a philosopher, scholar, teacher. He has a master in philosophy of religion from Talbot, a PhD in philosophy from Purdue, currently a professor of philosophy at Oklahoma Baptist University. And he's the author of a book called Cultural Apologetics, Renewing the Christian Voice, Conscience, and Imagination in a Disenchanted World. Now, i got to be honest, I'm pretty excited. We're going to have kind of a nerdy conversation. We're going to throw out names like, you know, Leslie Newbigin and Peter Berger and, you know, all kinds of fun sociologists that kind of add this whole dimension to our Christian witness. So, Paul, it's, it's great to have you on the Breakpoint Podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. So cultural apologetics is a different field in kind of what we would might maybe large, more largely call the idea of apologetics. But just – I tell you what, define that term. That's the title of your book, Cultural Apologetics. I used to teach a course, by the way, at Bryan College called Cultural Apologetics where I was just into all of this sort of stuff. To me, it was so important and so helpful. So define that whole term for us. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. About five years ago, I was asked to teach a course at the seminary I was teaching at called Cultural Apologetics. And so I did what any educator would do. I Googled that phrase. And um, <laughs> there's, you know, very little out there, really. And so what I ended up doing that first semester was just assigning seven books on culture, on the gospel, on apologetics. And then the next semester, I'd sign a, a different seven books. And after doing that class five or six times, I finally came to understand at least how I'm viewing cultural apologetics. So basically, the idea is that the gospel is never proclaimed in a vacuum. And there's this collective mindset that informs whether or not the gospel will get a fair hearing. But there's not just this collective mindset. There's also this collective conscience or the values that our culture hold. And that, too, affects um, whether or not Christianity will get a fair hearing. And today, because we're largely as fragmented as our non-believing neighbors, you know, the church isn't always able to exercise a prophetic voice. But it's not just the collective conscience and the collective mind. I've also realized it's the collective imagination of our culture that matters. Oftentimes, as Christians, we, we pretty much view the world the same way everyone else does. And so we'll use words like ordinary or everyday. But that's actually not how the world is. And so came to think about how can we work with God to reestablish the Christian voice and the Christian conscience and the Christian imagination in our culture so that the gospel will be viewed not just as true to the way the world is, but also true to the way the world ought to be. In other words, a cultural apologetic is helping to show that Christianity is both true and satisfying you know, to those within culture. I think one way to understand this, and you use the example in your book, and we already threw out his name, Leslie Newbegin. Yeah. I think Newbegin is one of those rare voices that probably has more to offer the church today than ever before, which is saying a lot. Right. But I know he had a big influence on you as well. So uh, talk a little bit about who Leslie Newbegin was, and I think just even explaining that will kind of help our listeners kind of get their hands around the sorts of things we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so as a young, uh, you know, right out of college, I was a young campus minister. Not too many years prior to that, I had become a Christian. 
And so began this process of sharing the gospel with students on campus and noticed, you know, here I am, a young evangelist. Truth is on our side uh, with Christianity, but there's this kind of odd disconnect where our students were kind of getting beat up in the classroom. And I started to wonder what's going on. And then I stumbled on to Leslie Newbegin and his little book, The Foolishness to the Greeks where basically what he did was in the 1930s, he was sent from Great Britain to go to India to minister to the Hindus and to share the gospel. He ministers there faithfully for 40 years. He comes back to his sending country, comes back to Great Britain in the early 70s, only to realize that in the the years that he was away, his own country had become, as he would describe it, post-Christian. And so he began to wrestle with this question, how do I have a genuine missionary encounter, and this is the way he puts it, with the whole way of thinking, living, and perceiving that we call modern Western culture? And in many ways, I think, in our post-Christian West, that question, New Begins question, is the crucial question for us. How do we have a genuine missionary encounter with the whole way of thinking, living, and perceiving that we call modern Western culture? Well, and that was a disruptive thought, right? Because we think of America as the center of Western civilization, Western civilization really being kind of, you know, the history of Christendom. You know, we're the missionary sending place. You know, people leave us and they go to the other parts of the world. But that was a huge insight that really when we're dealing with even Western culture, we no longer have – and I want to say we no longer have home field advantage. Not that we don't live in God's world. In that sense, we always have home court advantage. But that Western civilization had been largely afflicted with ideologies that had kind of stolen the imagination, to use the word that you used a few minutes ago, that was a disruptive insight for missiology, I think. Yeah, it was. And and just since you said we can be nerdy today, um, there was was another sociologist named Philip Reef. He was a Jewish sociologist that taught at the University of Pennsylvania. And he said that to basically this time period, the time period we find ourselves in now, is unprecedented in human history. And it's unprecedented because it's the only time in human history where we have largely viewed our lives as disconnected from the sacred order. So he calls it the severing of that connection between the sacred and the social order. Every culture prior to this culture thought that there's a very tight connection between the sacred order and then the social or natural world. And so, yeah, Newbegin was putting his finger on something that sociologists have come to sort of... um, to speak to as well, but it's been this long unraveling that began a little bit before the Enlightenment and has culminated in the word that I prefer now, you know, that we live in this disenchanted age where we no longer perceive the world in its proper light and there's a whole lot of other implications to it. Well, I want to get into those implications because we are going to be nerdy. And yeah. I think if you, me, and Bruce Ashford sat down, we would talk all night about these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Earlier this year, Bruce and I did a session for our Colson Fellows around you know some of these ideas about where culture is and throughout a lot of these names. And I want to talk about disenchantment, but I want to since we're throwing out names, one of the I mentioned Os Guinness's book and the whole idea of the grave digger thesis that Christianity introduced some of the ideas to the world that ended up undermining it in the long run. You know the universe universe was ordered, the universe could be understood, the scientific project, which is a really fascinating area of study. But before that, I really got to credit a seminary prof of mine, Ben Mitchell, for an independent study class making me read a book by a Regent College professor named Craig Gay. And the book is called The Way of the Modern World. I've probably gone back to that book And he's a secondary source. The footnotes in that book are worth the price of admission. I mean, you know, again, Berger, uh, Charles Taylor, Philip Reef, and so on. But he uses the phrase, and to me, it's a helpful way of introducing the idea of disenchantment, which if we're going to understand plausibility, we've got to understand disenchantment, which is Charles Taylor's term, right? But Craig Gay talked about what he called practical atheism. And to me, that was a really baseline way of saying, and here's how he defined practical atheism. He's like, the problem in modern society is not that modern man's an atheist because 90 – at that time, you know, that book was written in the late 90s or early 90s maybe. And he said, you know, at that point, you know, 90 percent of people would still say that they believe in God and Western civilization. But the problem isn't that they're atheists. The problem is that they're practical atheists. It's not that they believe that there's no God. It's that they live their life as if God is largely irrelevant which is a profound difference. You talked about the severing of the sacred from the social order. Of course, that starts on an individual level Mm -hmm. of seeing the world as not being really an enchanted place. And that's really kind of what Charles Taylor meant too, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so Taylor, I think, has done a lot to bring this language of disenchantment back into the vernacular. I've noticed a lot of people are thinking and writing and speaking on this. 
But in many ways, the key insight, even to Charles Taylor's work on this, uh, his mammoth work, it's like a 900-page book called The Secular Age, um, his key insight is that disenchantment changes everything. You know, that it makes, not only does it make unbelief possible, and of course we've got, as you know, we've got vocal, confident atheists today who are, you know, derailing belief in God as delusional or destructive or dangerous or so on. So not only does it make unbelief possible, as Taylor puts it, but it makes belief more difficult for us, for Christians, you know, and it's so disenchantment is a game changer. And that's why one of the big burdens, I mean, I write this book, in many ways, it's been, you know, almost two and a half decades of wrestling with this question in the context of a university, you know, how does the gospel get a fair hearing? But in another way, I write this book for my kids, you know, and I'm thinking about what is the state of the gospel going to be for them when one of the chief characteristics of a disenchanted age is this felt absence of God. That affects the church just as much as it affects those that are not, you know, within the church today. And so, yeah, we've got to be thinking, we've got to be recapturing this sort of more ancient way of viewing the world as enchanted or God bathed and God infused and things like that. My guest today is uh, philosopher Dr. Paul Gould, and we're talking about his book, Cultural Apologetics. One of the things that I find this kind of line of thought most helpful is, you know, I kind of got into the whole worldview study, and it was very much comparative worldviews. We talked about secularism as being the secularists and what the secularists believe, and here's what they believe about this, that, and the other. But that's a little bit different than secularization. I mean, this huge impact of disenchantment. And of course, when you untether, talk a little bit about how dramatic that impact is. I mean, when you untether the world from God, I mean, it impacts anthropology, it impacts certainly sociology, it impacts morality, it impacts almost everything. And it's kind of like we don't even realize how much even Christians can be secularist with a twist. Yeah, that's right. It's an opportunity for compassion for us as apologists, as believers, because it does affect everything. I've always been struck with um, A.W. Tozer, who was an old theologian who wrote, he wrote a little book called The Knowledge of the Holy. In the very first line there, he says, uh, what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about you. And then he said, if you get that wrong, you know, if we get our view of God wrong, and I would just say God and the world he has made, he, everything else goes wrong downhill from there. And that's exactly what's, I think, some of the chief characteristics of a disenchanted age, not only the felt absence of God, but then you have this corresponding, right on the heels of that, this commoditization of everything, where everything, only people and things are used, you know, with respect to what kind of pleasure are they going to bring, and that's about it. And then you have this sort of rampant foolishness and idolatry that's just run amok, and that affects, of course, everyone. And so I found this is such a helpful way to understand not only where we are, but this hope of, you know, re-enchanting our own lives. Uh, The ancients would just talk about embracing a sacramental view of the world. The reality was for the first 1500 years of the church, everybody thought that there was a tight connection between the sacred and the social order. And, you know, everybody believed that the world was God's gift and it was enchanted and that there was a natural order to things. And so wisdom was not just to understand the natural order of the world, but to live according to its grain. But of course, with disenchantment, there's this idea that there is no natural order to the world. And so anything goes. And that's why, you know, our news feeds on social media are are full of such confusion and outrage and foolishness, really. Shane Morris here again. I hope you're enjoying John Stone Street's discussion with philosopher Paul Gould. And we'll get back to them in just a moment. But first, I want to alert you that this Wednesday, April 10th, We begin our next short course. This time we have apologist Sean McDowell speaking on how to answer questions to Christianity. On four consecutive Wednesdays, Sean will help us prepare ourselves to answer these questions. If God, why evil? Can the New Testament be trusted? Can gays be Christians? And the age-old question that even Pilate asked, what is truth? Just come to breakpoint.org to register. And if you miss an evening session, don't sweat it. We'll be recording them all and we'll send them to you. Again, come to breakpoint.org to register for our next short course, How to Answer the Four Big Objections to Christianity. Now back to John Stone Street and Paul Gould. You know, Brett Kunkel, he and I wrote a book on A Practical Guide to Culture, and you know, we talked about technology in light of that. And that's, you know, we talk about technology as kind of, you know, putting screens in front of us, being distracting, um, you know, railroading pornography into our lives. But, but the other thing, just kind of to go along with what you said, and this is an example of disenchantment, uh, 
it makes us think that access to information, which we have now whenever we want it, more information than we could possibly ever use, but it's that access, that immediacy is the same thing as wisdom. And that's a dramatic loss in an individual life. But I think you also see that impacting kind of a utilitarian way of doing church. And so a lot of a lot of this, since this kind of disenchantment it changes even how we think of our life together as believers in ways that I think there's times I, I think about T.S. Eliot, A.W. Tozer, I think they would have just had an aneurysm if they if we transplanted them in today's culture. It, it would just be too much for them. Yeah, you're right. And this is where, again, just to add another voice to this, I think a lot of the um, cultural liturgy project that Jamie K.A. Smith, I mean, there's some really good insight in that whole project where, especially this point where, you know, he emphasizes that we're shaped by the habits, you know, he calls them liturgies, but they're just the daily habits that we embody in our lives, whether it's the so-called secular ones, like where we go to watch TV and shop and things like that, or even in our church, you know, if we're Going to church as disenchanted people, you know, we're going to walk out of that church without any genuine experience. You know, we're seeking these little episodes of experiential pleasure or something like that. But when they don't happen because we have even our wrong view of what worship means, you know, we're going to walk away. And of course, the statistics bear that out, too, with our young uh, leaving the church. And so this is we've got to re sort of connect with this. uh, The way that I like to put it is that we've got to begin to see and delight in the world the same way Jesus does and then invite others to do that. And that begins with us, I think, as Christians, uh, you know, in this first step, step of cultural apologetics begins with us. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. What's that look like practically? How does it begin with us? How did Jesus see the world? What's the relationship between our mind, our rational capacity, our reasoning capacity, and our imagination? Uh, just walk us through some of the insights. It's true that we are rational animals, as Aristotle famously put it, but we're not merely rational animals. Others have noted that we're desiring animals, that we're imaginative animals, that we're moral animals, that we're narratival animals. So the idea there is that we, all of us, and this is how God made us, is that we live our lives in virtue of some story that we narrate our lives with. And this kind of makes sense. Like we have this sense as we come into the world that we come into an ongoing story. And so even in my evangelism, I've noticed that I begin now with this question, you know, is there a story that understands you? Of all these competing stories out there, you know, and you could catalog them, naturalism or postmodernism or consumerism or whatever, you know, is there a story that's alive and that understands you? Because everyone is narrating their lives according to some story. That's the role of the imagination. And that's why that's so important in evangelism. It's so important in discipleship. It's so important in terms of, you know, even as we go to church and things like that. And so how can we join with God to re-enchant the world? Well, I think it begins, I mean, some of these will sound simple, but, you know, reading the Bible on its own terms and immersing ourselves in the world of Scripture, because there you find a living and active God, and you find a God-bathed world. And so I would just encourage readers, you know, read the Gospels, you know, and ask, how did Jesus view the world? And then, you know, I've always been struck with, I think it's 1 John 2, 6, that says, if anyone, you know, claims to follow me, he must be like Jesus, you know, he must follow in his steps. And, um, you know, so let's immerse ourselves in that world. And then I would say, you know, begin to read thinkers who hail from a more enchanted age or who, or who teach us to think, well, people like C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, I think, got this more from an older age. People like St. Augustine uh, would be a great place to start. And this is maybe the more radical claim is to start to incorporate beauty and to value those artists who help us see into our lives. Because in many ways, beauty, especially that now, you know, we're people of the book, but we live in an age of image, and we're so moved by image and beauty. But as we put our theology caps on, well, beauty finds its source in Christ. And so, so we can use the aesthetic currency of our day to actually set people on a journey toward the source of beauty, which is God. And so I'm just encouraging people as we take time to notice beauty and incorporate it into our lives, we'll begin to see the world, I think, actually more clearly for what it really is. Hey, since you made a pitch for Lewis and Tolkien, and obviously anybody who's listened to Breakpoint more than once knows that we're huge Lewis and Tolkien fans, and obviously St. Augustine we talk about a ton. I'd also add, because you said something really important a few minutes ago where you said that we all kind of think of which story best narrates our life, which story can we find ourselves in. And that's one of the strengths I find of the Christian worldview is that the Christian worldview, when you compare these different understandings of what it means to be human— 
the Christian worldview gets the human condition really well, right? I mean, we're there's something more than us than just being animals, but we're clearly not God or we don't act like God. And I tell you, one ancient thinker that has, uh, I think, really powerfully captured what it means to be human and argues it both in an imaginative and a rational way is Blaise Pascal and Ponce's. Uh, you know, his stuff on the human condition in there is really just stunning. That's right. Do you agree? You have to agree. How can you disagree with Blaise Pascal, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes from him is the section where he, and this is so helpful in our cultural apologetic in our evangelism. He says, you know, deep within the human heart, there's this memory of a memory of a time when man, capital M, humans were truly happy. And I think that that's really helpful because we have this sense in our hearts that something has gone drastically wrong, you know, that this isn't the way the world's supposed to be. And that we have that intuition that something's gone wrong because we have this, as Pascal put it, this memory of a memory of a time when we truly were happy. And so as we begin to dialogue with others, I think we can actually join with God to reawaken that longing, that memory of a memory, and set them on that path to return home, you know, which is the gospel and heaven and everything that's thrown in, as Lewis would put it. So yeah, absolutely. Pascal is another influential voice in my own journey of... Hey, I'm just telling that. everybody, the yeah. best bathroom book you can buy is Blaise Pascal's Ponce's, because That's they're right. all bite-sized thoughts that he never had a chance to put together. And so just put it in the bathroom and educate yourself, you know, redeem the time there, right. is That's what good. I often tell folks. Yeah, it's just fantastic. I wanted to come also back to uh, just that idea of re-enchantment and disenchantment. And we could spend an hour on this. We've already spent, you know, over 20 minutes here. But, you know, my friend Matt Hurd, who's a, a pastor down in Florida, talks about part A and part B of the gospel. You know, John 21 says, you know, all these things have been written so that you might believe. That's part A, right? And that's where we often talk about the gospel is believing, you know, as rationally committing ourselves to what is true. We never want to lose that. But then he goes on to say, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. I love that in chapter two, you start the chapter by quoting, you know, John Cougar Mellencamp, you know, life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone. You have a lot of pop culture references there. And it's interesting in this kind of late secular, disenchanted, dehumanized age that we have the opportunity for the gospel being that thing which promises life more abundantly is so incredible. But we got to do more than just speak. We've got to live into the story. We've got to show that there's meaning. I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, there's a great opportunity if we can grasp some of the truths in your book to actually, for the church, as Chuck Colson would say, to be the church, to actually speak to the heart, to capture the imagination. In other words, it's kind of dire news when, to a world that's lost God, mm-hmm. but it's also an incredible opportunity for the gospel. Yeah, I think so. And this is, you know, part of this comes from my own shortcomings. You know, I'm a philosopher by trade, and so I love arguments, and I give arguments, and of course, we have, you know, that's essential to any faithful cultural apologetic. We have to show the truth of the gospel and all that that entails. But the more that I've been thinking about it, I mean, we're more than that. And so, and the objections to Christianity are different. Like, you know, and we tend to, in apologetics, focus on the charge that Christianity is unreasonable. And rightly so. I mean, it's been maligned as unreasonable, and it still is. But there's so many more objections, you know, to the goodness and the beauty. And the thing that I love, the more that I get to know Jesus, and the more that I find my identity in the gospel story, the way that C.S. Lewis would put it, right, Christianity is this perfect blend of reason and romance, and by romance, he meant they're this longing for home, you know, that memory of a memory that Pascal talked about. And so you find everything you want, and that's why he thought it was, that Christianity was true myth or true story. And so, yeah, we've got to tell the better story, and of course, we have the greatest possible story. That's why I love, you know, Anselm is this ancient philosopher who talked about how God is the greatest possible being. The more that I've been thinking and writing and studying the gospel story, it's not just the greatest story. I believe it's the greatest possible story. And in this story, of course, you find tragedy, right? There's man's tragedy of sin. But then you have true comedy in the highest sense of that word. So comedy, we're familiar with sort of low comedy. But comedy, in the best sense of that word, is the unforeseen, you know, the unexpected. Who would have thought that God himself would become man, would take on a human nature and pursue us, 
you know, and then the tragedy of the cross. And who would have expected that from that tragedy of the cross, God would resurrect so that we could have new life and forgiveness of sin and this unending story. And so really, the more that I've been thinking and immersing myself in the gospel story, that is the best possible story. And so we've just got to find our identity in there. We've got to tell it well. You know, we own creativity, right? Because we were created in the image of the creator God. And so we've got to be men and women that are creators of the good and cultivators, I should say, of the good, the true, and the beautiful uh, in our art, in our storytelling, in our tweets, in our PowerPoints, in our lawn mowing, in our omelet making, you know, whatever it is that um, do it with, you know, beauty in mind as well. So, yeah. Yeah, this has been really helpful in my own just walk with the Lord to think more robustly about the gospel. Yeah. Well, listen, I hope people pick up a copy of your book. Again, it's called Cultural Apologetics, Renewing the Christian Voice, Conscience, and Imagination in a Disenchanted World. And if you've been listening, yeah, we've talked about a lot of nerdy names and that sort of stuff, but it honestly could not be more practical. And I think, Paul, it would be particularly helpful to pick up the book and read it heading in to Easter, uh, I mean, this is a time when the entire world's going to have conversations about Jesus. We're going to have those terrible documentaries on National Geographic where they only, you know, interview Jesus seminar folks. And we're going to have people that are actually willing to accept your invitation to church. And you're going to wonder, like, why is it that I can make a very clear case for my faith? And why does it just go past each other? And how do I make it more plausible? And that's all the stuff that Paul deals with here in his book, Cultural Apologetics. Come to breakpoint.org, click on the link on the homepage that says resources mentioned on the radio and podcast. We got a long list of resources and lists for you today. Uh, All those names, Leslie Newbegin and Blaise Pascal and St. Augustine and uh, Charles Taylor and so on and so on and so on. And I hope that this conversation and this book sparks a journey for you as a follower of Jesus that Christians need to take, which is what kind of age do we live in? How do I really get to the bottom of it? And Paul, I just thank you for writing the book. I think it's really, really good. And I think it's a very helpful introduction to things that have been long lost in terms of our discourse on how to take the gospel to this cultural moment. Again, Paul Gold's been my guest. Uh, He's a professor of philosophy at Oklahoma Baptist University, PhD in philosophy from Purdue University. Paul, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. I feel like we could have gone on, but we're out of time. But thanks for being my guest today on the Breakpoint Podcast. Yeah, thanks so much, John, for having me. It's been great to chat with you. Blessings to you. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. And don't forget to visit breakpoint.org to register for our next short course with Sean McDowell, How to Answer the Four Big Objections to Christianity. Our last short courses have all been sellouts, so don't wait too long. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.